wonderful things about all of this morning's session. So thank you so much to all of our amazing speakers and attendees for making this a wonderful day two of the SciAxis Conference. Our featured keynote speaker today is a personal hero of mine and someone who I'm so excited is, is taking time out of her very busy schedule to join us this afternoon. Dr. Temple Grandin is a professor of animal science at Colorado State University and has an amazing successful career consulting on livestock handling, equipment design, and is an advocate for animal welfare. Half of the cattle in North America are handled in facilities that she herself has designed. She's been featured on everything from NPR to BBC to national television shows such as Larry King Live, 2020, 60 Minutes, and can be seen in her 2010 TED Talk. Articles featuring her amazing story and incredible work have been featured in Time Magazine, New York Times, Discovery Magazine, Forbes, USA Today, and just about every other major publication that I could find. The reason I actually learned about her work to begin with was through the HBO movie, uh, Emmy Award winning movie about her life called Temple. If you haven't had the chance to check this out, I highly recommend you go home tonight, tomorrow, and watch this movie. Uh, it's it's uh, truly amazing to learn about her story and the work that she has done revolutionizing the cattle industry and being a renowned, world renowned autism advocate. She was inducted into the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2016. And I had the pleasure, shortly thereafter, of connecting with Temple when I was working at the NASA Kennedy Space Center. And so here is me freaking out. <laughs> oh, yeah, right behind my ear uh, is the rocket launch pad where they launch uh, uh, most of their major uh, rocket ships in space at the NASA Kennedy Space Center in Cape Canaveral, and Temple and I happen to be standing on top of the Vehicle Assembly Building at NASA, which is where all of NASA's rockets, ooh, there we go, all of NASA's rockets from the shuttle to the new Mars missions will be launched. And so that was one of the amazing times I've gotten to, to connect with her, and I, um, I think we might want to check on the sound here to make sure it doesn't cut out for, for Temple. My, my, my part doesn't matter so much. <laughs> But um, I, uh, to this, in this very moment, that's that's how I feel. I'm just trying to look a little less nerdy up here. <laughs> but uh, ladies and gentlemen, and everyone else, without further ado, please help me welcome to the stage Dr. Temple Graham. Great to be here. Lots of stuff to talk about today. And I want to start out, that's my book, Calling All Minds. That has my childhood projects in it. One of my big concerns today are kids are growing up totally removed from the world of the practical. They're not using tools. In my livestock handling class, the students have to draw a scale drawing. And I've got students that have never used a ruler. In fact, they ask, why would learning to use this, do a scale drawing be important. Well, if you ever remodel your kitchen, maybe you might want to do a scale drawing. I talked to a doctor who said that he's having trouble teaching the young doctors how to sew up cuts because they've never used scissors. Now, we got to get kids back doing hands-on stuff with tools. Absolutely essential. Well, since it's the 50th anniversary of going to the moon, I thought I'd better have this up here. <laughs> and that was one of the finest things that our generation did. And I have to say, physical, visiting the vehicle assembly building, that was a very emotional experience. And inside there, that's the skilled trades department. This is an area where we are losing skills. You've got the really fancy STEM engineering, like to make the aircraft, but this is where you put it together, and you have to have that. I'm going to show you some other stuff we don't know how to build. Bridges, infrastructure, ski lifts. We're losing skills. And that's the picture from the top of the building. Found out later on we weren't supposed to be on the roof, but you know, <laughs> I spent uh, 25 years in heavy construction and, you know, we just still do stuff. Um, but you look at that, at the time that they were building that, they had a specialized welder in there making those scaffolding platforms so you can work on the rocket. And then I got to sit at the original launch director's chair. That was super cool. Then 
I was on a plane and I watched Notre Dame burn on a little screen on the plane. I had to be flying right at the time that that happened. And I got to thinking about their moonshot, 11th century moonshot, the flying buttress system. So it would support these beautiful windows. Well, who built this stuff? They were skilled trades. They were apprenticed in it. We got too much uh, sticking our nose up at skilled trades. Right now we have a huge shortage of electricians, plumbers, somebody's got to fix the self-driving cars. You've got to have people that do a lot of different things. And in my work in the meat industry, every autistic, welder, geeks, dyslexic, you name it, the special ed department builds food processing plants. I'll tell you that right now. And we are losing those skills. Okay, launch pad. It's all skilled traits. That's all skilled traits. It's not so much STEM stuff. Now, I'm a visual thinker. And what I'm very concerned about right now is us visual thinkers getting screened out. We can't do algebra because there's nothing there to visualize. Well, as we were walking around underneath that launch pad, I saw something in there that shouldn't be in there, and nobody else saw it. I watched a raccoon waddle down the stairs and go off into the bushes. And I get to thinking, what have you been chewing up? <laughs> so the right stuff goes to the moon, but the geeks and the misfits and the kids with the labels built the stuff. Mr. Tourette's built that launch pad. Project manager. This brings up a really important thing about identity. Would I rather be a Mr. Launchpad or Mr. You know, Tourette's? Or livestock professor or autism? Autism is an important part of who I am, but the career comes first. Most funnest stuff I ever had in my life had to do with careers. Sitting around in the job trailer and trying to figure out how to build stuff. My grandfather was a co-inventor of the autopilot for airplanes. And he worked with a guy who was almost definitely on the autism spectrum, who came up with this crazy idea of three little coils, and of course aviation stuck their nose at, up at it, and they had to tinker and tinker to make it work. Another reason why we need to be getting kids back to hands-on things is kids today are afraid to make a mistake. But when you work on hands-on stuff, you gotta tinker to get it to work. Yep, and uh, women often don't get the credit. You know, you've got the hidden figures ladies, uh, Katherine Johnson, and the bra seamstress is at Playtex. They won the bid for the moon suit. Oh, the guys didn't want to admit that. <laughs> There's a really, really funny um, article in the Smithsonian Magazine about how the Playtex project managers, I'm not even sure if they were engineers, they would design bras and girdles, worked on this, sitting in a room beside the mission control room, freaking out, when the astronauts were jumping around and prancing around on the moon, scared to death the girdle rubber might rip <laughs> because that's what it was made out of. <laughs> Obviously the helmet wasn't made out of that, but the suit itself. Okay, the thing I want to ask you is, what would happen to some top innovators if they were born today, in today's educational system? I think this is a really important thing to ask. I'm worried about them getting screened out. Kids with autism, dyslexic, ADHD. Now I go out to Silicon Valley and I've been to all the major companies. They avoid the labels. I actually had my slides examined to make sure I didn't put the A word on their founder. Yeah, they're avoiding the A word. The special ed department is at Silicon Valley. You might want to look at Bill Gates' antitrust depositions. Just look them up. Very interesting. Thomas Edison was probably on the spectrum. He was labeled a hyperactive, addled high school dropout. Jane Goodall only had a two-year secretarial degree when she did her famous work. Now it's over in the UK, but it was equivalent to a community college associate's degree. Would she be able to do that today? I think we've got to ask really important questions. Steven Spielberg, terrible student, got rejected from a top film school, bullied. I was bullied in high school, and the only places I was not bullied was where I had shared interest classes, like horseback riding, model rockets, and electronics. Another thing I've been doing in my talks now is jumping the silos. Yesterday I was at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, about the Silicon Valley, 
I was at a sustainable ag meeting, I was at a meat conference, or I went in a meat packing plant to do animal welfare auditor training. I really like this jumping around. We got to bust out of some of these silos. Okay, we need to keep these classes in the schools. Art, sewing, cooking, woodworking, playing musical instruments, theater, welding. I know a guy who's dyslexic, ADHD, stutterer, probably autistic, in his 60s, owns a metal fabrication company. And I watched him grow his business. When he, I know when he, I watched him 25 years ago start out. This is what's making me crazy. And the requirement for algebra is screening out your skilled tradespeople. In the state of Pennsylvania, if you don't pass the algebra test, you don't graduate from high school. So what do you do? Well, in the meat industry, and also even in the tech industry, you can go in the back door. In the meat industry, you get a job on the floor, learn all the jobs, gravitate over to the maintenance shop. Ten years later, you're managing the gigantic big plant edition. I have seen people do that. A Nobel Prize winner was 50% more likely to have an arts and crafts hobby compared to other scientists. That's why we need to be keeping these things in the schools. It's that simple. Steven Spielberg, he's probably on the spectrum. This is one of the slides that got examined right here. Bullied in school, loved calligraphy. Where would he be today? The thing that I see is I go to an autism meeting and I'll see a 16-year-old kid who looks just like the 25-year-old kid that's working in Silicon Valley. But the 16-year-old kid is getting babied and hasn't learned shopping. Just basic skills. Einstein, no speech and delays free, where would he be today? This brings up another thing. You got some kids that are real geniuses in math, but you won't know if you don't expose them to math books. Third or fourth grade little math geniuses, they're gonna do the work in their head. Let them. This is where the verbal thinking teachers, they don't get it. They don't get it that these kids do it in their head. And you, you can give me an algebra book, I might use that for doorstop. But there's the right kind of kid that if you give him an algebra book, he's gonna take off with it. But you won't know unless he is exposed to it. That's the important thing. Kids have to get exposed to stuff to get interested. Okay, I think there's a big debate about the value of humanities. I think the connection between Steve Jobs and so-called useless humanities programs such as calligraphy should not be ignored. That was one of the things that motivated Steve Jobs in design. We got kids that don't know how to hook up garden hoses, totally removed from the practical. We got to get kids using tools. We got kids growing up today that have never used tools. I'll tell you, skilled trades, electricians, plumbers, mechanics, welders who can read drawings, heating and air conditioning, guaranteed a job for life, full health benefits. Yep, new STEM people need us because you need us to like build a thing you launch the rocket off of. That's a skilled trades thing. Here are some robots made by kids out of old computer parts and then they might ask, uh, well, can we plug it into the charger? Is it gonna work? No, it won't work if you plug it into the charger. Big shortage of these skilled trades. People stick their nose up at this stuff. But I've worked with all kinds of skilled trades, big complicated Tyson plants, Cargill plants, big complicated heavy construction. It's not something to stick your nose up at. It's, um, it's real difficult stuff. We are losing these skills. All right, what's that? Super fancy dancy hotel in New York. I call it the reality distortion field. $500, $600 a night rooms there. But when I was on the 10th floor of this hotel, and I looked out the window, the water was only 10, like 100 feet away. And if it comes up two foot, the basement will fill and the reality distortion field is gonna be uninhabitable. <laughs> We've got too much where the financial sector's pushing too much of the other stuff around. Okay, Apple, they need tech coders. You've also got really fantastic um, it, it, uh, structural glass comes from Germany. That's another skilled trade thing we don't make. We're importing this stuff from Europe 
because we don't know how to make it. It's extremely expensive doing this. This is not some outsourcing thing. It's due to losing skills because the way a lot of stuff in industry gets developed, and I've been in industry for 45 years, little tiny shops start that make something. Then they make another thing, and then they grow. Well, the young kids now haven't taken the welding class or the skilled trades class to start making the little shops that grow. And there's my book, Calling All Minds. That's my bird kite, little wing tips, just like the modern planes have. And you're going to have to tinker to make it work because I couldn't get exactly the same paper. And there's one of my drawings. Now this brings up, there's a lot of talk in the autism talks about resumes and about interviewing. You know how I handle interviewing? I simply showed off the portfolio. I would lay a drawing like this, this is one of my hand done drawings, this was done in the 80s, and I'd lay it on the desk and then put pictures, trade magazine articles. I showed the portfolio rather than emphasize myself. So why did I put on there, you have to touch to perceive? I watched the entire meat industry, every single one of them, go from hand drafting to computer drafting in the mid-90s. And we started getting strange mistakes on drawings. Like the center of the circle wasn't in the center of the circle. And the person that had done that had never drawn by hand and had never built anything. I got a set of drawings less than two weeks ago from another meat company, I won't name it, for steel and concrete construction. And I go, wait a minute, you've got a concrete stem wall here with a fence on top of it, how are you fastening the fence to the concrete stem wall? Where's your detail? Do I use a weld plate? Do I put it on there with anchors? Do I run the post down through the concrete? How do I anchor the fence? Half the rebar wasn't drawn in on it? No detail. 26 sheets or so of stuff in three dimensions I don't even need. Give me a set of details that's got the rebar placement in it. I couldn't believe it. And it was done by a professional engineering firm. I'm not going to say where it was, but this is two weeks ago. It was a crappy set of drawings that somebody paid a lot of money for. And I was going through there and we were marking in all the, uh, the details. Like how do you fasten the stuff together? When you're weird, you got to show your work off. You sell your work rather than yourself. So that's simple. And there's a, one of the pictures from my original portfolio, that I, the way I sold Cargill. You know how I sold Cargill? Designed the front end of all their plants. I showed this picture off. I showed that drawing off. I sent it to them. And this is the replica of the dipping vat system that they made for the HBO movie. I love the fact that the HBO movie sh showed all of my projects. I really, really like that. It got my work stuff in there. It also shows exactly how my visual thinking works. It showed that absolutely perfectly. There is my brochure for my business. It's uh, black and white because colored printing was too expensive in the 80s. So you did things in black and white. It's called four color printing. You got to run it through the press four times. It gets kind of expensive. But what you want to do is show somebody a 30 second wow. So they'll look at it and they just go, wow, you did that? Common denominators are some of the unique minds. Growing up with lots of books and learning. Early exposure to careers. I came into the cattle industry as a non-agricultural person. I was exposed to it as a teenager. That was out on my aunt's ranch. This brings up another really important thing. Students get interested in stuff they get exposed to. And you're going to find out if you like it. You might also find out if you hate something. That's why it's so important to do internships. And I really liked this program that I heard about just before lunch they're doing at Wright State University where they get the students um, into school clubs with a major, then into internships, and start the transition to work before they graduate from college. Learning how to work, major issue. Mentors. I had a really great um, science teacher. Uh, he got me interested. I also had some good people in the cattle industry. Learning how to drive. There's problems with multitasking. That's going to take longer. I did 200 miles on dirt roads before I did any traffic. That solves the multitasking issue. You've got to get that driving into motor memory 
in a really safe place like fields and giant parking lots, deserted office parks on weekends before you do traffic. That's me uh, cutting some wood, riding a horse. These are the kinds of activities that as a teenager saved me. And they were the only places I wasn't being bullied and teased. Shared interests. Friends through shared interests. Really important concept. And then they got to see a SpaceX launch when I was there. I get to try out my new iPhone camera. I was kind of amazed at what it could do. Broaden the kid's interest. Okay, if the kid likes cars, let's read about cars. Do math with cars. Learn about how engines work. Find associative links back to the thing they're interested in. When I was a young kid, I would just draw the same horse head over and over again. Well, let's draw its saddle. Draw its, draw its bridle. You expand it. You expand that um, fixated interest so it's less fixated. Also, you expose kids to different things, they might get a new fixation. After all, fixations come from stuff they see in the environment. They don't just come out of nothing. Now, I'm seeing a lot of grandparents and parents come up to me who have had good careers that find out they are on the autism spectrum when their kids are diagnosed. See, diagnosing autism is just a behavioral profile. And, it, and they keep changing the behavioral profile. And the, and, the, and the spectrum goes from top Silicon Valley scientist to somebody who can't dress themselves to all the skilled trade geniuses I worked with, and some of them were geniuses. You gotta figure out how to plant some, keep a plant running when you're tearing down half of it. That really takes some know-how. And the, most of these parents had decent careers. They had paper routes when they were 11, learning how to work, and they learned how to work at a young age. You see, you always want a gradual transition from academics to work. They ideally should have some real jobs in the summer before they graduate from high school. Now the thing is, autism in its mild form is just part of brain variability. That's all it is. You see, people with autism have more relatives in the tech fields. In fact, I, there's a, a website, Hit Clusters, on my website around the tech areas. And bipolar people have more relatives in creative careers. See, a brain can be more social-emotional, or a brain can be more cognitive. It, 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 it's how you allocate the resources in the brain. And in the mild forms, it's just personality variation. The more severe forms, speech delay, yeah, that wouldn't, that's not the way people normally develop. Now, I love this paper. Genomic trade-offs are autism and schizophrenia, the steep price for a human brain. The same genes that make the brain big also cause autism and schizophrenia. There's lots of different complicated genes that make our brain big. Now in autism what happens is you get extra growth back here and you shortchange the social. Maybe you get an art department back here, or a math department, or a music department, or maybe memorizing all kinds of stuff de department. <laughs> Short chains of social. Now what happens to schizophrenia, the network is too skimpy and it fails. Developmentally, they are opposite conditions. What you gotta do with a lot of these kids is you gotta stretch them. You gotta stretch them just outside the comfort zone. Don't throw them in the deep end of the pool. There's a lot of problems with multitasking. You don't take an 18-year-old uh, person on the spectrum and their first job is a super busy clothing store at Christmas time. You don't do that. That's throwing in the deep end. Way too much multitasking. Sudden surprises scare. Expose them to new things, but give them choices. Give them choices. After I got kicked out of ninth grade, mother found three different special schools and she let me pick. And that, then I went to the special school for three years uh, for the first three years I was there, I cleaned the horse barn. I ran their horse barn for three years. I didn't do any studying. But I was learning how to work. I'm realizing just how important that is. This is one of my most important slides. And in my book, The Autistic Brain, I've got the evidence base for this. I am a photorealistic object visualizer. That's the skilled trades kind of person, the art person industrial designer, photography, those kinds of jobs. Absolutely can't do algebra. Kids like me should jump straight to geometry. You know, flunked the, um, the, the grad record exam, totally trashed it. So how did I manage to get through college? 
Well, in 67, finite math was the required class. Matrices, probability, and statistics. Bit more visual, and I could do it. But you're locking out your skill. There's two things that are locking out your skilled trades. It's the algebra requirement, and we've taken the hands-on classes out of the schools. And introducing kids to this in the community college is too late. We need to be introducing kids in middle school, ninth grade. All right, your, st your typical STEM person is your spatial visualizer. It's patterns, patterns. But you need us if you want a launch pad to put your rocket on, because that's going to be a skilled trade thing. Have trouble with reading. See, we need to have the whole team. Then you got the verbal facts guy, really good at words, often really good at any kind of job that record keeping, details, specialized sales. There's been some good uh, experiences where they sell cars and do really well at it because they know the product. Then you've got some dyslexics that are auditory thinkers. And there's scientific evidence that these different kinds of thinking exist. Just go online, type in the terms object visualizer and spatial visualizer. Those are the scientific words for this. And we need the different kinds of minds. And when you end up getting a label, your mind tends to get more specialized. Good at one thing, bad at something else. Well, there's a big uh, visual thinking circuit that I got, nice big one. I like to show those off. <laughs> and that's the rect algebra circuit. I have no working memory at all. So we have to do a workaround. Any task that involves sequence, I need a pilot's checklist. Even for something like the Starbucks coffee machine. Tear down steps, one, two, three. Cleaning steps, reassembly steps. Don't need a book. I just need one to three keywords for each step on the pilot's checklist. And, it's, and also, when you look at a pilot's checklist for a big fancy airplane, it's chunked. Pre-takeoff, no, pre-taxi, pre-takeoff. And there's maybe five or six things in each chunk. They don't just lay a hundred item checklist on you. But working memory, I don't have it. See, the problem I have with algebra, I can't remember it because I can't create a graphics file. There's no graphics file. Now what you do need in skilled trades is old fashioned uh, sixth grade math. Find the area of a circle, percents, angles, that stuff, I had no problem with doing that. All right, how do you determine what kind of a thinker a kid is? Visual thinkers love to build things. Mechanical ability, this is the guy that can build anything but flunky math. We need him. He's the guy that builds all my cattle handling stuff. And your mathematical thinker, that's your computer programmer. Kids that are good at math. Now we're concerned about who's going to win in quantum computing. Is it going to be the US or is it going to be China? Well, one of the ways to help it be here is to find these third and fourth grade kids, expose them to old fashioned geometry and algebra books and see if the bug bites. I want the old-fashioned stuff, not the verbal stuff. Some kids will be a geometry kid, another kid might be an algebra kid, and I'm probably not going to be much of either one of them, but I know how to find the books and give them to them. <laughs> because if you bore these kids with boring math, they're going to turn into gigantic behavior problems. And some people go, well, they're not developmentally ready. Boom, boom. And then you have the verbal thinkers who love history. Here's what Thomas Edison had to say about mathematicians. I'm not a mathematician. I can always hire a mathematician, but they can't hire me. <laughs> and there's my book, The Autistic Brain. You want the evidence based on these different minds? It's in there. And I've, I've also dug up more recent articles on it, too. All right, let's get into aviation. Yeah, Brad over here is a bit of an aviation geek, too. I bought him a cool tie, uh, 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 aviation tie. They have those red flags on stuff, remove before flight. I got him a remove before flight tie <laughs> <laughs> up at the, at, the, at the Air Museum. All right, we need visual thinkers in engineering. All right, this is a question that a Boeing engineer used to do with uh, engineering students at Texas A&M in the first year of engineering class. So this great big toolbox full of tools, big craftsmen, with big heavy things. It's on a crane. It's dropped 20 feet onto an airplane wing, a half-built airplane. And so the mathematicians and the engineers calculate it, and they find, yeah, it's within the critical limits on stress, but barely. It's within the critical limits, but barely. What would you do? 
Don't overthink this one. All right, you want to look at it and imagine the toolbox hitting that? You throw the part away. That's the correct answer. 15 years ago, 90% got it right. The day they try to calculate it, probably going to be down to 50% will get it right. They should be throwing the part away. And then I'm visualizing making sure that part is destroyed by running over it with something very heavy so it can't possibly be used on another plane. <laughs> I'm worried that our visual thinkers are getting screened out. You need us. All right, does anybody know why Fukushima burned up? I can't design a nuclear power plant. But all I need to know is if the emergency cooling pump fails, I'm in a lot of trouble. It has an electric motor, electric generators to run it. And they put it in a non-waterproof basement. Not a very good idea when you live next to the sea. If they'd had watertight doors, it would not have happened. It's the kind of stuff that when I was working in construction, I used to buy this kind of stuff. Sump pumps, got to put that in there too. It wouldn't have happened if I'd had some very simple equipment that wasn't, well, that was cheap, inexpensive to buy. I couldn't believe it when I found out why it happened. And it's, they, don't, they don't exactly advertise it that this is what happened. <laughs> All right, Boeing, the two plane crashes. I found the emergency airworthiness directive from the FFA, and they told the owners, this was after the first crash, uh, that uh, the plane could lose altitude, be difficult to control, and have possible impact with train. Well, they like their jargon. <laughs> impact with train. That's engineering speak for crashing. <laughs> I'm not kidding. That's the wording I took right out of the airworthiness directive. Now, the thing is, engineers calculate risk. Visual thinkers see risk. All right, let's say I had a laptop up here and I put the water next to it. That's I can amazing. see this going on the laptop. I that's that right. that's seeing risk. I can also see solutions to problems. So the first, I, then I found out what an angle of attack sensor was. It's a very fragile part on a plane that measures air angles. A little thing that sticks out of the side of the plane. Next time you get on a plane, you can look at them. Little fragile things. And they only wired, they wired their anti-stall system. What does anti-stall system spell? Anti-stall system. <laughs> I think a plane needs a new name. Anti-stall system. Uh, they wired the anti-stall system, which would push the nose down if the plane stalls, to a single angle of attack sensor. Okay, that violated all rules in engineering. You're trusting a single, extremely fragile sensor. If you held one of those in your hand, there's no way you'd trust one of those. I mean, you see a bird taking it off? Just rip it off. What happens if you bust that thing? Well, the computer's default setting was to shove the nose down. How could you do this? You only used one of them? You see, these are some very, very basic questions here that weren't asked. Questions so basic, you don't need a degree in aeronautical engineering to figure it out. But what I've learned, the mathematical mind doesn't see it. They didn't see the water filling the basement. I can see the water. I can look at a door like that. Let's say the water went against that door. You'd see it leak around the edges. The next thing you know, this auditorium is going to be full. Not be pretty. Steve Jobs loved calligraphy. Now, the reason why your phone's easy to use, because an artist developed the interface. That wasn't done by a programmer. Steve Jobs was an artist. An artist made the interface that you look at on the phone. Engineers had to make it actually work. That's the different minds working together, because the engineers would have made the phone interface so complicated, nobody would have wanted the phone. We need visual thinkers in science. There's been a lot of problems in, in uh, cancer research and other research on replicating experiments. And some of the problems have been in differences in the methods. Very small differences in methods. Like one set of researchers might shake their cells real like this, and another one do, does this. There's a machine that goes like this. I've seen it. I'm seeing it now in my mind. Gentle shaking versus hard. Change the results. I review a lot of journal articles. I'm going to rip apart the method section. You didn't give me enough detail so I could visualize how you actually did this experiment. 
I love this marine innovation boot camp. So you get a pile of junk from the base, and you say, let's make a vehicle out of it. Let's make something to count trucks, just out of a bunch of junk. And they learned a really interesting thing. The truck mechanics were better at doing this than the degreed engineers. They could MacGyver it. <laughs> yeah, we need those people. And the Marines are beginning to realize that they need them. And our educational system is screening them out. PhD engineers don't know what to do with a bunch of junk from a base that they just threw out there. I'm sure they've had some wheels in there. And they just say to you, make a vehicle out of it. All right, who builds a large food processing plant? Beef plant, pork processing plant, chicken processing plant. That's getting back into my industry. The visual thinkers like me do all the drafting, do the whole entire plant layout. They also design and build all the highly specialized mechanized equipment, conveyors. I call it the clever engineering department. This is where we're losing skills. The math thinkers, engineers, boilers, uh, trusses, refrigeration, this stuff we still do. And the visual thinkers are not getting replaced. Let me show you what we don't make. State-of-the-art pork processing plant. I won't show you any slaughter, don't worry. Uh, look at all those complicated conveyors. That's all from French Canada. It's all coming in from Holland now because we don't know how to make it anymore because we've taken the welding classes out. Now we know how to make more fancier stuff like landing gear for airplanes. The Dayton Airport, I was up and close and personal with the brakes of a 737 that was on display there. And when you look really, really close to that, that's, uh, that's not welding things in a shop. But you see, this stuff is just making stuff in a shop. How about a chicken processing plant? We don't do that one either. 100 shipping containers worth of stuff. We need people making elevators, this sort of stuff. This is the skilled trades department. Now this is a Steve Jobs theater. And I'm standing in the middle of it, they're screaming. So why am I screaming? Because that carbon fiber roof and that structural glass wall came from Germany. We are not making it anymore. And when I went to the chicken processing plant, my chicken hat's jumping all around for joy because it's going to be really humane how they do the chickens. But my educating hat is weeping and screaming and crying at the same time my chicken hat's jumping for joy. You say, I'm like this kind of, you know, busting the silos. Let me tell you, this whole place vibrated. I screamed in there. <laughs> now, we did make the earthquake isolators that are in the Apple mothership building that they call Infinity Loop. Now, of course, they did not let me get anywhere near the new phones. I didn't see anything like that. <laughs> uh, ski lifts, uh, we don't make many, those, many of those anymore. Uh, the best roller coasters. This is more sort of what I call the clever mechanical engineering department. All right, people that are different have uneven skills. Uh, here's Grace Murray Hopper, computer pioneer. She flunked Latin. Brilliant in math. That fits kind of the pattern. All right, let's get to Stephen Hawking. That's some of the math that Stephen Hawking did totally in his head. He couldn't write. So when he did the famous Hawking radiation theories, it all was done with this Penrose geometry math. You can look this stuff up online. This is great stuff to show kids. Let's show this stuff to kids in third grade and show them the math that goes along with it. You've got to show kids interesting stuff. Now, I went to the Denver Science Museum and the, in the Science Museum in Denver, and I want to commend them for this, they do tool, um, woodworking shop in the museum. What they used to do in my elementary school, kids do in the museum now. Art? <laughs> uh, the school ought to be doing this stuff. How about patterns in nature? Really, really cool stuff. How about quasi-crystalline graphene? That's very cool stuff. It's all patterns. Well, in science and nature, that ought to be in every high school library. Science and nature. I'll tell you what's hot in STEM material science. It's hotter than hot. 
I can tell you just which courses to take. I fail every single one of them, but I can tell you, let's take some chemistry, some physics, computer science, let's chuck in a little electrical engineering, and you're going to be really cool for STEM and this stuff. Let's rescue that kid before the video games get him addicted. What I'm saying in too many of these kids with a label, one goes to the basement to play video games on a social security, and the other one gets out and has a life. Or he gets to go to Silicon Valley. So when I was at Apple, well, they had this fancy little uh, snack bar. I had avocado toast with red pepper sprinkles. <laughs> and then I had a very exotic drink. And there was a kid next to me. You know, when you're almost 72 years old, he's a child. And I asked him what he did. And he worked on hardware. And I said, how did you get this job? And he said he came off a farm. His professor knew somebody. That's the back door. That's how half of all decent jobs are gotten. You know somebody that gets you into a job. Fractals, that's pretty cool. And Stephen Hawking said, concentrate on the things your disability doesn't prevent you from doing well. There's too much emphasis on the thing they can't do, and not enough emphasis on the thing we can build into a career. Yeah, he could float around the way it was playing too. He could do that well. <laughs> Visual thinkers, artificial intelligence, and people with autism and ADHD are a bottom-up thinker. Also, autism and ADHD have crossover. Genetic crossover and brain structural crossover. So I just found a paper just the other day on that. That's why they're mixed up all the time. Fully verbal autism, ADHD, crossover. Yeah, they're not all that different. But the thing about bottom-up thinking, concepts are formed with specific examples. That's why in the talk this morning, I wanted specific examples of how to help this kid that got into trouble and make it a whole lot less abstract. And I learned that AI thinks the same way I think. In order to understand a concept of a cat and a dog, when I was a real little kid, I sorted them by size. But that didn't work when a dachshund came into the neighborhood. <laughs> so now I had to figure out what does a dachshund have that's in common with a dog barking, her smell, and the shape of her nose. See, I could no longer sort by size. You see, the more information you get into the database, the better they think. That's why we got to get them out there doing stuff. Another thing I want to bring up is medication. There was talk this morning about panic attacks and everything. I went through all that stuff. I have been on a low dose of antidepressants since my early 30s. And in the movie, I was eating, pro, um, I was eating uh, yogurt and jello because everything I ate went straight through me. It was completely awful. And when I went on the low dose of antidepressants, these problems stopped. And you can read about that in my book, Thinking in Pictures. I also worked with visual thinking designers, three of them, in the 80s and the early 90s. One that I'm almost sure is undiagnosed autism, the other two probably weren't. They're all on low dose Prozac, or they'd be in the gutter on drugs and alcohol. It's just that simple. Um, and where would those people be today? This is what worries me, and they're all hands-on people. Uh, concepts are formed with specific examples. Verbal thinkers, and the educational systems run by the verbal thinkers, too much top-down, too much overgeneralization. Because they think totally in words. Yeah, you ought to see a verbal thinker's idea of a risk analysis. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> Now, in working with animals, you see, I can understand animals because being a visual thinker, I can understand sensory-based thought. They don't think in words. It's sounds. They're really into tone of voice. What is it seeing? What is it smelling? That's how animals think. Now, here's the iPhone that can diagnose cancer, skin cancer. Now, the way it's trained to diagnose melanoma is you show it 3,000 melanomas, and then you show it 3,000 ugly age spots like this and other things, and it learns to sort. It's bottom-up thinking. I'm going, wow, artificial intelligence. It's the autistic brain, but it's only as good as the data you put into it. All right, here are some tips for working with minds that are different. 
I got a small processor. So we got to work around that. Now once I got the, uh, but I've got a cloud computing for memory. So if I got the Amazon cloud or the Microsoft cloud, whichever one you preferred, open for doing drawing, that small processor doesn't hurt me. But where it messes me up is if I have to multitask. It messes me up in social stuff because I have to shift the tension. If your phone on one bar, it takes time for that website to load. You're working with little kids, you've got to give them time to respond. So this is why the driving, you've got to do all this practice to get driving and motor memory before we touch traffic. That gets rid of the multitasking problem. Pilot's checklist for anything that requires sequence. You've got to stretch. Stretch just outside the comfort zone, but we don't chuck them in the deep end of the pool. We've got to limit the, the screen time in the computers. Silicon Valley parents limit screen time. Steve Jobs hardly let his kids touch an iPad and provide choices of hands-on activities. So we need to be doing. Little kids, slow down when you talk. Give them time to respond. Always encourage them to use their words. And when they make mistakes, you explain what they should do. So if I stuck my hand in the mashed potatoes, you say, use the fork. Don't scream no, give the instruction instead of saying no. Sensory problems, highly variable. Some people have hearing sensitivity problems. Some have visual sensitivity. So certain kinds of LED lights, or fluorescent lights will flicker. And when they go to read, they can see the print jiggle on the page. Here's a simple fix for it. Try pastel paper. Light lavender, light blue, light gray, light tan, all your pastel colors. Find the right one, the print stops jiggling. How it works, nobody really knows. Except in the back of the head, you got circuits back here for shape, color, motion, and texture. They have to work together to make a graphics file. Something's wrong with those circuits. So both a developmental problem or a head injury can cause these same problems. Uh, headphones, you want to not wear them all the time. Now sometimes a noise a kid can't stand, like a blender or, or a um, vacuum cleaner, it's better tolerated if the kid can turn it on and off, where they control it. They can sometimes get to where they get used to it because they are controlling the sound. And there's an interesting paper here called Autism Environmental Enrichment is an effective treatment for autism. Three keywords here. Autism Environmental Enrichment. Type those three keywords into regular Google. The paper will come up. Slow transition to work. Jobs on a schedule outside the home. It could be dog walking. It could be a volunteer job. They've got to learn skills like shopping. I'm seeing too much overprotection. Where they go, oh, Tommy's got autism. He will order his hamburger for him. I, don't, I go, no. He's got to go up to that counter and order his own hamburger. They need how to keep a real job before graduation from high school. But the problem we have in a lot of programs is you might get somebody to be a math genius and you put them in with people that can't dress themselves. Well, he's not going to make quantum computing for us. I'll tell you what you need algebra for. Linear algebra. You need that for quantum computing. I can find this paper online. I type in linear algebra quantum computing. I don't understand this paper, but I could give it to the kid that would understand it and could take off in math. That's about all I can do with that paper. I can find it online and then give it to him. Then he can find all the other cool math stuff. Okay, what is the ultimate goal of education? Where is a student 10 years after graduation? I was working on those DIPVAT projects. This is what we need to be looking at. Where is a student 10 years after graduation? And there's another aerial photo of some of my original projects. This is from my original brochure. I like to show off the uh, things I actually use, all black and white, for color printing, way too expensive. There's another picture of it. And they're starting my career in construction. I spent 25 years in it. I would sell a job. I would design a job. I showed you the drawing. I would supervise this construction and start it up. Now the thing about construction, there's an urgency here. I'm seeing too many parents go, oh, we're thinking about a job. You've got to get things done. And I were some good people in construction that mentored me. And when I criticized welding on well, that first job as pigeon doo-doo, the plan engineer pulled me into his office and explained that, that was really rude and I couldn't be doing that. You see, he told me what I should do. 
and he did it in private, in his office, in private. Really important. The other thing, while we're talking about skilled trades, I went to a real fancy dancy tech company, I'm not gonna say where it was, but it really annoyed me that the big engineers, they get jobs in the tower, and my department stuck in the basement in a tunnel with cable trays? Don't treat us this way. You need us. Every time I see a cable tray now, it makes me mad because I'm seeing that picture. And the people in drafting and drawing were so happy that I came down to see them. Yeah, you need us skilled tradespeople to build something like the Mars rover. Somebody had to build that thing in a shop. Some of that stuff just by hand. And there's another one of my mentors, Jim Uhl, construction guy. And he seeked me out because he'd seen some of my drawings, helped get my business started. Now when I first said yes, I'd do this project, I had no idea how to do that steel reinforcement. Boy, I had to get some drawings, I had to scurry around, work hard to get the knowledge. Understanding animal behavior, aided by visual thinking. I'm a visual thinker. So it was obvious to me to look at what animals were seeing. Attention to detail. I saw that raccoon in that launch pad, nobody else did. And the first thing I visualized was, what are you chewing up? Yeah, it could be something really important. I'm sure you scientists know what that is. Eclipse shadows through a tray. I didn't know eclipses made these funky shadows. I, wa I noticed this, I took a picture of it. I watched 100 students walk over this. This is on the sidewalk at our library. They just didn't say it. Chains hanging down in chutes. Cattle won't go through the chute for vaccinations or at the meat plant. They're not afraid of getting slaughtered. They're more afraid of a piece of paper going like this, coming out of a paper towel rack. And there's a, another one of my drawings. You sell the work, not yourself. That's the key. So if you're a programmer, I'd get it really nice on an iPad showing, all right, this is what the app does that I made. Here's some of the code. In other words, put the work out there. Got to have non-slip flooring for animals. All right, let's see how you good at my little test. Raise your hand. You saw that that animal was looking at the sunbeam. What? I show this to a bunch of mathematicians. They all flunk it because they don't see the electric emergency cooling pump drowning. See how basic that is? Do I need a degree in nuclear physics to figure that out? No, I don't. Animal memories are specific because they're sensory-based, not word-based. The verbal thinkers in education, they overgeneralize. Way too much overgeneralization. All right, and let's get a little understanding of visual thinking. Okay, people will say, my horse was fine at home and he went crazy at the show. But you've got a lot of new things there. If I train a horse to tolerate a blue and white umbrella going opening like that, this is the work of Leonard and Fent in Germany, that doesn't train the horse to a tarp or a flag because when a tarp or a flag's flapping around, that looks totally different than an umbrella. You see, it's specific because it's sensory based. It's not word based. There's a little yellow tape that can stop them. I'm going to just finish up and show off some more skilled trades. This is my center track restrainer system. You go have a steak. At it. We had beef. There's a good chance that was handled in my equipment. And this is a piece of equipment that I developed that the cattle ride on. You can see the title in the movie title slides. It's in the meat plant. All the big plants have it. I worked on this all through the 80s, the 90s, out there in the field. And there's some pretty heavy steel there. All custom built. That's not done by stupid people. Now we've lost the ability for the pork plant and the chicken plant. We can still build this. We got one person left that knows how. Yeah. He's already had cancer and a heart attack. This is the thing I'm worried about, losing the skills. We need to be able to build these sort of things. And there's more pictures I put in the portfolio originally. There's some more pictures. And I think I'm doing pretty good. If somebody you thought might be retarded, half the cattle are handling the equipment I've designed. Maybe we'll just end it right there. Because I hope I got you thinking, because I want to have some time for some questions. All right, let's get some questions. 
I'll just put you back here and let you look at the. Yeah, stupid people don't do that kind of steel work. This is not building a shopping center. <laughs> You mean we're not going to have any questions? <laughs> okay, right there. You got a question, right? Oh, good. Okay, great. Thank you so much. You mentioned that many parents and grandparents are being diagnosed or finding out that. Well, the grandparents, I'm, I, this is happening all the time. I show that slide at me, autism meetings, and I have parents, oftentimes older parents, come up to me and they go, oh, Grandkids get diagnosed and then they figure out they're on the spectrum and they had a paper out at age 11. The other thing, in my generation, social rules were taught in a much more structured way. Shaking hands, uh, just basic things like that. Are you finding that there's much research or resources available for adults who are diagnosed later in life? Well, I've got a book called Different Not Less. And I'm actually looking, we're going to update that book, I'm actually looking for some people to to add some more profiles to it. People diagnosed later in life that have had decent jobs and where the diagnosis helped them was not on work, relationships, marriages, boyfriends, girlfriends. That's where the diagnosis gave insight. I'm seeing too many kids held back on the job front. Thank you very much. Okay, right here, right here in the front. me to play with those building toys. Good. Well, my very first job, I was very lucky because I got a manager who has a son who has autism, so she's very experienced with that my kind of thinking. What kind of a job do you have? I work at Once Upon a Child in Grove City. I do various things. I process clothes, I work with the cash register, I help organize, but she made sure I didn't get overwhelmed. I started out with one thing, tagging. And then I well, you start out and don't, you see, work into it gradually and be uh -huh. careful about the multitasking. See, because the problem is if you're a small processor, multitasking is a problem. I was saying for kids who aren't like me, who don't get into a good manager for their first job, what would you recommend? Well, it can be a, be a problem. You see, now the, the kind of people I have the most experience with are the engineering types. Oh, there was an electrician guy at one plant I worked with. He was brilliant. Had a little shop and everything was fine. And then the plant got sold. And they switched him to another plant and he had the wrong boss. It was a real mess. When he was at the first plant, he had a little shop and people would just come and ask him to make stuff for him and he'd do it. And I'm almost positive he was undiagnosed on the spectrum. Uh, it's engine, then you have the word thinkers, where I've seen them really excel, especially sales. Car dealership, specialized business insurance, things where knowledge of a specialized product is appreciated. Car parts was another one that's been successful, where they didn't, he didn't even need the computer program, he just memorized every part in that store. You know, like Napa auto parts, something like that. Uh, you know, the, the boss, you see, the first thing is the multitasking. The other thing is clear instructions on what you're supposed to do. One thing I learned in my jobs is I'd want to find out what the outcome of the project was. I've got to do, you know, three people, this many cattle per hour, uh, stay, stay 10 feet off the railroad, the spur right away. You know, what were all the site restrictions? In other words, the parameters of the project. Let me do the design, but I need to know what's called the site restrictions and I need to know that up front. You don't just say to somebody, oh, go design software. That's way too vague. You say, no, I want this program, this platform, it has to do this specific thing and stay within this amount of memory and then let them figure out how to do it. You see, it's a specific outcome that it has to have. Do not be vague. Uh, let's say customer contact. You might say, now watch how Susie interacts with a customer, and then copy how Susie does it. Don't say you're too aggressive with customers, because that's vagueness. 
or you know, watch a certain video or something to see how to interact with customers, even when you're on the shop, on the store's floor. You see, now as I'm talking about these things, I'm seeing it. See, it's absolutely not abstract. It's also specific examples. It's bottom-up thinking. See, in the talk this morning, it was all way too abstract. There was talk about having to have breaks. Well, as an employer, I can do a five-minute or 20-minute break, a two-week break, and we got a Tyson plant to build, uh, uh, trying to get the drawings done. That's not gonna work. You see, this is where, I, and I worked with every, well, back then, they were just called geeks and nerds, but they were dyslexic, autistic, ADHD, you name the label, I worked with them in construction. And they were brilliant, and they're all retiring now. They're not getting replaced. Ton of jobs, full health benefits. Hi, Temple, um, I'm Star up in the front, and I just had a question about a company or a business leader that you had to work with, and maybe um, you worked no, I worked with them all. I worked yeah. with the best plant managers, and I worked with the absolute worst. Yes. But I had the full the spectrum. One, the worst company. How did you clearly say that this needs to be done this way? And have you used any technology recently that you really like that helps show more of an idea of what you're trying to say? Um, any technology? There? Well, I had a website up before websites were hardly existed. That's one thing I did because uh, I recognized that that would get things out. The other thing that really helped me advance my career was good writing skills. You see, I would do a project and I'd write in a farm magazine or in a meat trade magazine. And there's a scene in the movie where I go up and I get the editor's card because I realized if I wrote for that magazine, that would really, really help my career. So I would do a project and then I wrote about it. And what was unique about this project to make it newsworthy? And then I'd write about it in the national meat trade magazines. And what I'm seeing, another problem today with our regular college students and our grad students, some of them have awful writing skills because nobody red marked up their work. When I got kicked out of ninth grade, my writing skills were better than some of the graduate students today. Okay, maybe they can pass standardized tests but writing was important. Okay, the talk that I listened to at the um, Wright uh, State University, I said, do you have a paper on this? Do you have anything written on this you can give me? You wanna get that method to spread, you're gonna have to put videos up online or you're gonna have to write about it. And this brings up the other thing. I spent more time transferring technology than I ever did inventing it. That's another thing, I've got a paper online uh, transferring technology and I described the center track restrainer. So I get it put in the first plant and then I got to go to plant number two and they made changes on it, completely messed it up, glad I was there. Transfer of technology takes more time than inventing it. So like this really good thing from Wright State University, please write it up and put it in something that's going to be permanent, open access so that other people will read about it and you'll find out 10 years down the line that somebody in some other country's doing it. I'm, I have found that with things on Grandin.com. Grandin.com's my, my cattle website and pig website and templegrandin.com and autism. Put the stuff out there. In other words, let's fix things bottom up and then here's an example of something that worked. You don't write about it, nobody knows about it. And just write how to do it, not a bunch of jargon. We, you know, education's got their jargon, engineers got their rubbishy jargon. Let's just write about it, you know, like impact the train, really. <laughs> I saw that, I'm going, you've got to be kidding. Uh, Dr. Grandin, over here. Yep. You came to Kent State a couple years ago. I can't tell where the sound's coming from, okay. I'm sorry. You okay. came to Kent State a couple years ago, and our students on the spectrum um, were in the audience. And you spent so much time with them after your presentation. It was so impressive. Thank you. I have a question. Well, thank you very much. I try to do that. I try to be someone that's accessible. I've given my phone number out to a lot of people. And because I want to see, I figured now at my age, I need to encourage the younger ones to do everything I can to help them be successful. Right. OK, so then after that, we got them together in a group, right? We have uh, several groups. But they're not getting along very well. Do you have any recommendations on what we can do to facilitate a group of, of diverse thinkers? Well, and then, so we're not, 
Yeah, because you might want to talk to the right state people because they have meetings with theirs. Uh, one of the ways to keep things, uh, keep meetings on task, keep meetings on task is one way, not just let it be a free for all. Uh, I just went to that right state talk, it was just great. Uh, uh, let's say we're going to find out, okay, how are you doing in classes? So we got, you know, don't take three hard courses all at once and set, you out, set yourself up to fail. Uh, keep the meeting on task, where we're going to talk about, let's say you have, you have a ten of them, you can have each person tell about their classes, each person tell about an intern experiences, keep it on task. And then they're not going to fight because they're on task. That's one of the things you can do. No, oh, you have the same problem in construction sites, too. <laughs> oh, let me tell you what you do with a political science degree at Colorado State University. You become the project manager for our new chemistry building that was finished about two years ago. You start answering phones for a construction company. Then you start working on the bids. Next thing you know, you're running the chemistry building project, project manager, whole entire project. You see, you've got to deal with all the people problems on these big job sites. Oh, let me tell you. Been there, I've seen all of that. And plant managers, I've seen them from the very best from the absolute worst. Had the whole range of them. So you had referenced a few times before that pork and chicken plant the knowledge on how to make them is lost and there's one person left who can make beef plants. If things like that have been written up, shouldn't it technically be easy to replicate that knowledge and replace what is holding this back? It's not all that easy. It's not all that it's easy. See, that they, you see, the thing is, some of these people, they don't write the stuff up. A lot of it's kind of proprietary, so the drawings are not available. So the company shuts down. I can think of equipment on that we, we worked on 30 years ago, some meat processing stuff. No one would even have any idea how to build it because they, they could go into the patent database. They could possibly do that. Someone would be patented, some of it wouldn't be. But losing know-how is a really serious thing. Well, and you see in other factories too. You have to have like an automated warehouse, conveyors to move stuff around for anything and we're losing that. And the reason why the Europeans are doing it, and it's super expensive for them to do it, they've kept skilled trades. That's the reason. Yeah, you might have the fancy, super fancy rocket, but you need the skilled trades launch pad to put it on. You say it's all important. And I went inside that launch pad. I know what's in there. It's skilled trade stuff. Dr. Granin, we have one final question okay. right here in the back. Hi, right, thank you. Um, just really quick, I know you've been in the ag business for decades, and I was just interested if, uh, if you have any experiences with gender or sex-based discrimination for being in such a male-dominated field for as long as you have. Well, let me, have, let me tell you, being a girl in the 70s going into the cattle industry, that was a much bigger barrier than autism ever was. You have to be three times better than a guy. And you know what else I learned? And it took me 10 years to learn it, and I was a little disheartened about this. I used to think that maybe the guys really knew everything. They don't. They don't. I, well, there was a guy, who came out of sales. This is about, about this, how much he knew about a, anything to do with a food processing plant. And he built a plant that didn't have enough wastewater treatment. He was told it didn't have it. It closed, a $20 million mess. I was actually on that project, it was over 20 years ago. How could you do that? He still has a job after, after doing that? Big ego. Yeah, I don't know about a colossal failure. That was. And, and the thing I've learned that kind of appalls me is how you can have managers that know so little. See, when looking at the Boeing thing, no, I'm not an aeronautical engineer, but let's say I was suit in charge. I've got to make decisions about these planes. You need to be knowing enough so that you could make decisions. I said, no, I just want to talk to you about this. And don't give me engineering gobbledygook. Explain it to me so I can understand it. And, and uh, I, I, I was a shock to learn 
that certain managers of certain very big things often have very little knowledge. And then you got the financial sector, they need to take some responsibility for these plane crashes. There was pressure put on Boeing to not have to recertify the pilots in the simulator. Because to make that plane fuel efficient, you had to put these gigantic, huge, wide engines on it and mount them differently. They lift up the nose of the plane, make it more prone to stalling. So that's why I had the computer to shove the nose down. So that computer also made the plane fly like your granddaddy's Boeing 737. And they didn't tell the pilots. Well, the pilots are going to have to do simulator time now. You see, that was a marketing thing that pushed them to do something they absolutely shouldn't have done. And one of the problems with all this finance stuff, it all gets too abstract. Until water fills the basement of the reality distortion field. Thank you very much.